All right, well, today we're looking at lie number 22 and also number 23, which is related. But first, it says this, lie 22, you should put off your old self so you decrease and Christ increases. Now, folks, this is one that is close to home, literally, because you can drive just a mile or two from here, I believe. I haven't measured it, but it's not too far away. You can drive a mile or two from here and see a billboard that says, less of me and more of him. And man, that sounds so spiritual and humble that you would want less of you and more of Him so that Jesus would shine and you would diminish. Maybe you go off in the corner and go into nothingness and then Jesus would shine. Now, the issue with that is God already had that. And then He decided to create you. Remember Adam and Eve? Well, what was before that? We didn't exist. It was all of Him and none of us. But God decided to create us and include us and invite us to the table. And through the cross and resurrection, we get to be part of this relationship. And God's not saying, you go off over here and I'll shine and you be a hollow tube, a fire hose, and I'll be all of your personality. No, you get to be you. And so this sounds really spiritual and humble. The problem is it diminishes God's creation, and it's not the truth of the gospel. So let's look at this. Here's where one possible misunderstanding comes from. The idea that we need to lay aside every day, get rid of myself, lay aside myself, put on my new self, get rid of my old self. Ephesians 4 says, You did not learn Christ in this way, if indeed you have heard Him and have been, and have been taught in Him, just as the truth is in Jesus, that in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, there it is, lay aside, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lusts of deceit, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. Now, here's the question. First of all, I mean, we do know, of course, every day I'm putting off old attitudes and I'm putting on new attitudes. I'm putting off bitterness. I'm putting off resentment. I'm putting on love. I'm putting on Christ. I'm putting on the armor of God. This put off, put on is obvious in reference to attitudes. But the question is, do I have to wake up every day and get rid of me? Do I have to wake up every day and get rid of my old self, half of me, part of me, a dirty half, get rid of my old self, lay it off, and then put on my new self every day, hoping that I can keep off the old and put on the new, and I'm a split personality. I'm living in this duality of the Christian life. I'm sinner and saint at the same time, people say. And then they call that humility. Now, is that what this passage is saying? Well, first, I want to take us back to fifth grade grammar for a minute here. And we're going to just consider these verbs, lay aside and put on. Now, these verbs, actually in English, we would have the word to in front of them. In other words, to lay aside and to put on. And in grammatical terms, these are infinitives. Do you know what an infinitive is? It has no time reference. It's like if I say to eat, to sleep, to marry, to dine. Those have no time reference. They could happen tomorrow or yesterday or a thousand years ago or in two weeks. They are just to eat and to sleep. They have no time reference at all. And that is what's happening with these verbs. And so let me tell you that when an infinitive is there, it can refer to any time period. And so what do I need to do to interpret it? I need to look around some. I need to look around some in the sentence, look around some in the paragraph to figure out whether it was past or present or future. Because think about it, I could say, I wanted to sleep. Is that past? Yes, it is. Why is it past tense? Because I said, I wanted past tense. It's attached to it. If I say, tomorrow, I will want to sleep. Now, that is future. 
because it has a will want attached to it. So let's just do a little bit of investigation here. Is this past or present or future? Well, it says you have heard, and then it says you have been taught. So you've heard that you're supposed to lay aside, and you've been taught that you lay aside, and then you were also taught, past tense, to put on. In other words, at salvation, you were told when you were given the gospel pitch that you don't keep your old life, that you say, Jesus, give me a new life. And you don't mix old with new. What happens at salvation is your old self, Romans 6, crucified and buried, and your new self comes up out of a grave, and you are a new creation, a new person. You were taught that this was going to happen. It happened at salvation. You laid aside the old and put on the new. Now, if you're still scratching your head about this and you're not so sure about this, well, Paul clears it up in Colossians with the same verbiage. Look at Colossians chapter 3. He says, don't lie to one another. Why not? Because you laid aside, same language, now past tense, you laid aside the old self with its evil practices and have put on the new self who is being renewed to a true knowledge. Yes, we're learning and growing and getting our minds renewed. There's a new knowledge coming, renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. So do you see it? We got two passages. One is supposedly neutral because it's like to eat, to sleep, to lay aside, to put on, and it's difficult to see the time reference, but it's there. And then we've got a second passage where the time reference is obvious. It is past tense all the way. You laid aside the old self and put on the new self. So guess what this means? This means you don't have to wake up and scrape off some old part of you. You don't have to wake up every day and try to get rid of your old self. You, you, you know the old saying, I keep trying to die to self, but... You know, I put myself on the altar, it just keeps crawling off. You've heard that? Well, there is no altar. The cross replaced the altars. There is no altar. You were crucified with Christ, Galatians 2.20. Your old self died, Romans 6.6. 6. There is no altar. It's a cross and it's finished. So therefore, count yourself. This is what you can do. It's kind of fun. Count yourself dead to sin and alive to God. I don't have to get myself dead, kill myself spiritually, reduce myself, diminish myself, make room for God because I'm in the way. No, you're the new self and you fit perfectly with Jesus now. That's what we need to see. I know we struggle. Let's take a time out and I'll come over here on the side for a side note. We struggle. We all struggle. That's called the flesh. You're not the flesh. We all struggle. That's called sin. You're not sin. You're the new self. Yes, we have opponents. Yes, we have enemies. Yes, there is temptation. It hits us every day. It's real. It's difficult. It's a struggle. But it is not you versus you. It is not half of you good versus half of you evil. It is not you trying to say no to yourself so that you can say yes to God and just stuff it down for 80 years. That is not the gospel. The gospel is you're a slave of righteousness. The gospel is you can count yourself alive to God. Please don't deny yourself. Count yourself alive to Him. You already denied yourself. That was your old self. You already took up your cross. You were already crucified with Him. If you're new, don't deny it. Don't deny yourself. Count yourself alive. Do you see the difference? This is a, a rootedness and a groundedness in Christ. And this is Him affirming who we are instead of religiosity tearing us down and trying to make us empty tubes or fire hoses through which Christ flows. Sounds good, sounds humble, but it ignores the new man and the new self. Galatians 2 puts it this way. You'll notice I got one eye in red and one eye in blue. 
So I have been crucified with Christ. That's past tense. It's no longer I who live. Sounds like you're done. You're gone. Okay, but that's the old you. Keep reading. Christ lives in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Do you see what I see? Yes, there is an I that died, but there is a new I that is now in town. Somebody took up residence. It's the new self, the new creation, and Christ together. God is blue, and so are you. Do you see that? <laughs> God is blue and so are you. You're a perfect fit with Jesus. You're not the old red eye. You're the new blue eye. And that matters. You're there. You're in it. You're in, it, in the midst of it. You're invited to the table. You get to participate. Uh, Peter says we're partakers of the divine nature. We're involved. We're one spirit with the Lord. We're in it, man. Do you see that? All right, all right, okay, but remember now, John the Baptist did say, and this is where we get the idea from, he did say, Jesus must increase, I must decrease. Have you heard this? I mean, John the Baptist said it, it's right there in John chapter 3, but what did he mean? Did he mean that we should become dirty worms grovel, groveling in the corner, and it's all Jesus and none of us? Well, look at what he's talking about. He's talking about his temporary ministry. That's what he's talking about. You yourselves are my witnesses that I said, uh, Hello, I am not the one. I'm not the Christ. I have been sent ahead of him. He's coming. I baptize him. I announce him. Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. I ain't him. Therefore, my ministry is temporary. My ministry is not the big deal. My service as a prophet will go away and his ministry will come in. I must dis decrease and he must increase. Talking about ministries because the new covenant is coming in through the blood of Christ. And then we take this, we take verse 30 out of context, put it on a pedestal and beat people up with it. you got to decrease because Christ is trying to increase and you're an obstacle. you got to get out of His way. You keep blocking His righteousness. And we think that sounds spiritual and holy and humble and all that stuff. And God is shouting, uh, excuse me, sir, you don't know what you're talking about. That is my child, holy, righteous, blameless, united with me, one spirit with me. I want it to be all of me and all of her in one spirit together. And that's the truth of the gospel. So it is not all of him and none of me. It is all of him and all of me in a beautiful union together. Romans 6, united with him in his death and united with him in his resurrection. And that is right now. So the truth about all of this then is that your old self is dead, buried, and gone. And your new self is a perfect fit with Jesus. Sin is not a perfect fit. The flesh, the old attitudes, they're not a perfect fit. I'm not talking about those. I'm talking about you. There's only one you in there, right? I'm talking about you. You are a perfect fit with Jesus Christ and you need to know it. As we're going to see in a minute, you are called a fragrant aroma to God. You smell good. <laughs> All right, lie number 23, very related Here's this fake righteousness idea, very interesting. Religious scholars, Christian teachers of so many kinds, we miss it and we take something beautiful and we water it down and we make it fake. And so this lie comes up often. You're not really righteous. God just looks at you that way. So he's fibbing to himself. He's lying to himself. God is pulling the wool over his own eyes. He's faking it till you get to heaven and then you'll really be righteous. But right now, he's just an accountant. And so he's over here looking at the books and he has cooked the books. He has cooked the books to make you look righteous 
on paper, even though you're not righteous, Yes, you're saved. Yes, you're heaven bound. Yes, you're going to a new place, but you're still that dirty, rotten sinner for now. But don't you worry. He's cooked the books. Is that the gospel message? That God is looking at you as if you're righteous? You know, the Jesus filter. Maybe you've heard this. You've heard the Jesus glasses or the Jesus filter. And he's got this filter up that's all Jesus. So it's like sunglasses, right? He can barely see you. And instead, he's seeing a whole lot of Jesus and very little you. And thank God for that. Because if he were to remove that filter, then he would see you for what you really are. Ooh, gross. Now, here's another analogy we hear. It sounds so good. You know, those old-timey scales with one tray on one side and one tray on the other. Well, Jesus is on one side, and good news, you're on the other. So you weigh the same as Jesus, even though if we were to really look at you, you haven't really been changed yet. That'll happen in heaven. But don't you worry, you're worth a lot, okay? But still... You're a dirty, rotten sinner. I mean, maybe there's some truth in that concerning your value, but it, it neglects resurrection life. It neglects heart surgery. It doesn't tell the whole story. Then the next one is simply just, we just spout off that uh, he looks at you as if you're righteous, as if you've never sinned a day in your life, and as if you're righteous, but you're really not. And then the last one, man, this one Sounds so scholarly. Woo! If you put a word out there like positional or, ooh, let's say judicially righteous. That sounds good. You're judicially righteous. I'll bring in a courtroom analogy. The judge has declared you to be righteous, even though you're not. You're positionally righteous up in heaven somewhere, but down on earth you're the same old you. And so we start seeing this language pop up in all kinds of commentaries. And then what happens is when you get to the good verses, when you get to the amazing verses about the transformation at the core of your being, well, all we do is we just lump those over here in the positional bin. Okay, we've got a little bin where we put all the great verses that we don't always feel like you are the righteousness of God. All oh, that, you know, that's that's just positional. You're born of the spirit. Oh, that's just position. You're a slave of right. Oh, I mean, positionally, that's true. Okay, but you can't experience that now because I don't always feel that. And so because I've, you know, got a lot of schooling and I don't feel that I'm going to call that positional. And you see this again and again and again, and it neglects the powerful truth of the gospel. So let's check out some of these passages and see what they really mean. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Now, did Jesus really become sin on that cross when he said... My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Bearing the sins of the whole world, he became sin. He had never sinned a day in his life and he became sin. We never did a righteous thing in our lives and we became righteous. It's a gift. It's a transformation for Jesus in that moment, hanging on that cross for us eternally, now and forever. We became the righteousness of God. Here's one, 1 John 3. Little children, make sure no one deceives you. The one who practices righteousness is how righteous? They are as righteous as Jesus Christ is righteous. Think about that. And then here's the opposite. Your other choice, in case you were doubting, you were wondering about your practice. I don't know if I practice. You're talking about practice. I don't know if I practice enough. Well, look at this. The one who practices sin is of the devil but the devil has sinned from the beginning. So those are your choices. You're either of the devil or you're as righteous as Jesus Christ. Which is it? Do you see that choice? This is nothing progressive. There's no middle ground. There's no halfway. This is all or nothing. You are either of the devil or you are the righteousness of God and as righteous as Jesus. He doesn't give us a middle ground on purpose. Look at this. 
righteous just as Jesus is righteous. Whoa! Romans chapter 6, very similar. You were slaves of sin. That's your other choice. That's what you were. And then it says you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. And having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. Now, I just got a question for you. I mean, was God faking it when he said you were a slave of sin? When God said you were a slave of sin, was he faking it? Was he looking at you as if you're a slave of sin? Or was he looking at you for who you really were? You were a slave of sin. He saw reality. Now, guess what? You're a slave of righteousness, and that too is reality. How did that happen? It's not some lens. It's not some old-timey scale. It is a heart surgery. Look. You became obedient from the heart. I will take out your heart of stone. I will give you a new heart. This is heart stuff. Your righteousness is heart related. We don't wiggle out of this and call it fake it till you make it. We don't wiggle out of this and call it future true but not true now. He's saying, past tense, we became obedient from the heart. 1 John chapter 2 if you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone also who practices righteousness is born of him. Again, we've got a weird comparison here. It makes us uncomfortable. Do you see? It's a comparison between Jesus and you. So this is what God is daring us to say. God the Father is daring you to say this morning that you are as righteous as Jesus Christ is righteous. Now, I have, you know, asked people about this, traveling, speaking, going church to church, and I say something like, uh, how many of y'all, and I can say y'all because I'm from Texas now, and I was usually an interpreter. <laughs> I say, how many of y'all are as righteous as I am? Raise your hand. And man, people will raise their hand. Sometimes with that one, I'll see two, and they're yelling, of course. And then I'll say, how many of you are as righteous as Mother Teresa? And all of the ex-Catholics there, they're kind of, you know, sort of going up. And the, How many of you are as righteous as the Apostle Paul and even fewer hands? And then how many of you are as righteous as Jesus Christ is righteous? And you're lucky to see one or two going... They're nervous, man, because they know they, maybe they should, because it's Sunday morning, they should say great stuff like that. But I mean, you've brought out Jesus now. You've brought out Jesus, the ultimate in righteousness, and you're telling me to say, I'm as righteous as Jesus Christ. I'm afraid I'm going to get kicked out of church. And that is exactly what this passage is saying. He is righteous, everyone also who practices righteousness is born of Him. Now, are you born of Him? I know what the accuser will do. he say, now, do you practice enough? That's not the point of the passage. It's love and hate contrasted. It's old practice of the devil versus new practice. There is a new trend in you. He who began a good work is going to carry it on to completion. And the only reason it's going to get carried on to completion is because you're born of him and as righteous as him. And that's real. It's an infusion taking out your heart of stone, giving you a new heart that is surgery. So here's a myth. Paul said, this is so common, Paul said he was a chief of sinners while he was a believer. So we believers should see ourselves as saint and sinner at the same time. That's humility. How many of you have ever heard that before? Paul says he's the chief of sinners, and if he wrote the New Testament, a lot of it, and he's chief of sinners, then who am I to call myself a saint? I should at least balance it out, saint sinner, because he said he was the chief of sinners, and he wrote a lot of the New Testament. Well, let's look at this passage. Here it is, at the very bottom. He says he's the foremost or chief of all sinners. But wait, back up a couple of verses. What's he talking about? Oh his former life. 
I was formerly a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent aggressor, yet I was shown mercy because I acted, past tense, I acted ignorantly in unbelief. And then he says, Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief of all. In other words, I killed Christians, so dude, I set the record. That's what he's saying. You want to talk sinner? Who have you killed lately? Have you killed church people? Who have you killed lately? Have you killed God's children? Because that's my history. I won the record, man. I'm a record breaker. I'm the chief of all, but I'm talking about my former life, not my new life, my former life as a blasphemer and violent aggressor. So do you see it? This same guy says he was crucified with Christ, buried with Christ, and became a new creation. And he does not want us using this out of context to somehow justify that I'm half saint, half sinner. If he was chief of sinners, I'm a... No. He's just saying, look how big God's grace is, because look how big my sinning was. But now... He's a saint, a child of God, a slave of righteousness, an apostle, and a teacher of the gospel. 2 Peter 1, he says, By these precious and magnificent promises, you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped, past tense, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust partaker of the divine nature. Dude, I'm sorry, but when you say nature, you've got my ear. Because nature is nature talk. It is not God pretending talk. It is that you have a new nature and you participate in God's nature and you are spiritually one with Him and it's nature talk. It's real. Not something that has to be nurtured progressively. It's not nurture. It's nature. And at salvation, you were infused with a new nature. Amen? Amen. All right, here's one. We're getting near the end, but I, I, I want to share this with you. It may be hard to follow at first, but I hope you'll track with me. To me, this is one of my favorite um, passages. So, Galatians 3. If a law had been given which could impart life, then righteousness would have been based on the law. Now, here's what I want you to look at, the yellow part. If a law had been given that could take a syringe and infuse you with life, then righteousness would have come by the law. If a law had been given that could take out your heart of stone and impart new life to you, shoot it in you, so that you are now indwelt and new at the core. If a law could do that, th then you wouldn't need grace. But a law couldn't do that. Only, only grace could do that. Only God's grace could do that. So, look at the synonyms here. They're in yellow. Righteousness is the impartation of life. Let me say that twice. Righteousness is the impartation of life. Righteousness is not fake righteousness. It's not Jesus filter righteousness. It's not old timey scales righteousness. It's not as if righteousness. It's not positional righteousness. Righteousness is life imparted. It's real. You see that? They're the same to Paul. Imparting you with life and imparting you with righteousness, they're synonyms. They belong in the same sentence. Righteousness is new life. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, this is the smell good. You don't need no spiritual deodorant today. We don't need you to put on any extra Jesus cologne today. We are a fragrance of Christ to who? To God. You smell like Jesus. That's not fake. Spiritually, you smell like Jesus. For we are a fragrance of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing, to the one an aroma from death to death, to the other an aroma from life to life. Timbit, my cat, Timbit, is missing now for two weeks. We think he's been killed by wolves or foxes, and we are sad at my house. But yesterday we went looking, we walked into the 
um, the pound. I guess that's, you still call it the pound. It's not very nice. Let's call it something else. What's it called? The pound? The shelter. Yeah. The shelter. That feels better. We walked into the shelter, which felt very safe. But let me tell you, there was a fragrant aroma. It smelled like cats. And I thought, maybe, just maybe, he's here. It smelled like cats. The whole place was just inundated with a fragrant aroma of feline. And he wasn't there. We're still looking. So if you've seen him, let me know. But here's the thing. You smell like righteousness. This room, if we could smell spiritually, this room is inundated with a fragrance of righteousness from life to life. You smell like me and I smell like you. We smell like each other and we know each other because when we talk, it is from life to life and from life to life. And yet, an unbeliever who were sitting here this morning they would know at the core of their being, wait a minute, there's something not quite right here. I need to understand this. I'm not sure where this is coming from. It feels like the wind to me coming out of nowhere. It's either crazy stuff or a religious crutch or something's not right. I'm curious. In fact, I was talking with a crowd of uh, teenagers, uh, young, young men from uh, university, in fact, 18, 19 years old. And Two or three of them knew the Lord, and it was obvious that one didn't, and he was super, super inquisitive. Tell me, what does it mean to be saved? Tell me, how do you know that you're saved? Tell me. He wasn't ready, but he was smelling it. He was taking a whiff of all that Jesus is, and he was curious. There's an aroma of life to life, and there's also a, an aroma where people sense their death. This is nature stuff. It's not nurture. It's not fake. It's not accounting. It's not bookkeeping. It's heart stuff. Real. So what did we see today? Jesus filter? I don't think so. God's looking right at you. You're born of God. He's looking right at you. The Bible says his face is toward, his eyes are toward the righteous. Even when we are faithless, he remains faithful. His face is always toward us. Old timey scales doesn't go far enough. As if you're righteous, not good enough. God's not lying to himself. Positional righteousness sounds good, but we've got more than a position. We've got a condition, a new condition, a heart condition. We're obedient slaves of righteousness. That is legit. So what's the reality? Here's what the Bible says about the transformation at the core of your being. You're born of God, born of the Spirit, partaker of the divine nature. You're the fragrant aroma of Christ. You have a new heart and a new spirit. You're the new self, a new creation, and you're a slave of righteousness. Do you see it? There's no room to put this in the corner and call it just a feel-good movement where I'm supposed to see myself as God sees me. Well, tack on because it's real and we're okay then. A very popular message, see yourself as God sees you because he's faking himself out. No, see yourself as God sees you because he is the only one who can fully discern reality. He took out your heart, gave you a new one. You're a slave of righteousness and he knows it. So listen up. And take on his view because he sees reality. Truth, our righteousness is real because of what God did to us at salvation. You'll have to forgive that. It's, it's called a typo. <laughs> but what God did to us at salvation, I want you to notice the words to us at salvation. It's not just what God did for us, but what God did to us. That's what we've talked about today. Many Christians are familiar with what God did for us. He died for us. Jesus died for us. He did a bunch of things for us. He forgave us our sins. He freed us from the law. I still haven't mentioned what He did to us. What He did for us is awesome. What He did to us is heart surgery. 
were born again, born of the Spirit, born from above, born of God. He did something to us, and we need to know it. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for the truth, the powerful truth of the gospel. We, we are not going to compromise. We're not going to water it down. We're not going to shove it under the rug. We're not going to pretend. We're going to say, we believe you. We believe you took out our heart of stone. We believe that we're obedient by nature. We believe that sin doesn't fit. We believe we're allergic to sin and compatible with righteousness. We believe you. We want to act accordingly. We want to choose rightly. But we need this truth and we need to be convinced, Father. And so we are asking by your Spirit this morning that you would convince us of the truth of who we are. We thank you that it's not going to get any truer, but man, we can live in fantasy or reality. It's our choice. Father, teach us, show us, counsel us, guide us into the truth. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.